Okay, so I'll just go right into the class. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya So this is the beginning of the 39th chapter, 10th canto, and this is Akura's vision. Okay. Sri Sukha Uvacha Sukha Pavista Paryanke Ramakrishna Mandita Lady Mano Vatan Sarvam Patiyam Sachikaraha Sri Sukha Uvacha Sukha Pavista Payanke Ramakrishna Manitaha Leave a man Patiyam Sarvam Pati Chakaraha Sri Sukha Ovacha Sukha Pavista Payanke Krishna Manitaha Lady Mano Vatam Sarvam Patiyam Sajakara Thank you. 
Sri Sukha Uvacha. <coughs> Sukadev Goswami said, Sukha, comfortably, Upavista, seated, Paryam K, on a couch, Ramakrishna, by Lord Balarama and Lord Krishna. Uru, very much, Manmitaha, honored, Lebe, he attained, Manaratan, his desires, Sarvam, all, Panti, on the road, Yan, which, Sa, he, Chakara, Ha, had manifested. <coughs> Translation. Sukadev Goswami said, having been honored so much by Lord Balaram and Lord Krishna, Kukura, seated comfortably on the couch, felt that all his dhamma desires had been contemplated on the road, were now fulfilled. All the desires he had contemplated on the road were now fulfilled. Verse 2. My dear King, what is unattainable for one who has satisfied the Supreme Personality of Godhead? The shelter of the Goddess of Fortune. Even so, those who are dedicated to his devotional service never want anything from him. Verse number three. After the evening meal, Lord Krishna, son of Devaki, asked Akura how Kamsa was treating their dear relatives and friends and what the king was planning to do. The Lord said, My dear, gentle Uncle Akura, was your trip here comfortable? May all your good fortune be yours. Are our well-wishing friends and relatives, both close and distant, happy? In your good health. My dear Akura, as long as King's Kamsa, that disease of our family, who goes by the name material uncle, is still prospering, why should I even bother to ask about the well being of our family members and other subjects? Verse 6. Just see how much suffering I've caused my offenseless parents. Because of me, their sons were killed and they themselves imprisoned. Purport. Because Kamsa had heard a prophecy that the ace son of Devaki would kill him, he tried to kill all her children. For the same reason, he imprisoned her and her husband Vasudev. Omagyan timidandasya ginajana salakaya chaksarun militam yena tasmai shri gadave namaha. Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Srimakti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Iti Namane Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pacharine Nirvase Sasunyavari Pastyatya De Sitarine Panchakalpa Tarubhascha Kupa Sindhu Pevacha Patitanam Bhavre Bhyo Vaishnave Bhyo Maho Namaha Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gadadara Sivasadi Gaur Bhakta Rinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Sri Sikhi Shaki Shaki Jai. So, so the uh, intrigue is being played out here. What is that intrigue? Kamsa wants to, he has a plan to kill Krishna. And he has this nice arrangement, he thinks, anyway, that's his arrangement. And he's uh, put powerful elephants, powerful wrestlers, and a competition for stringing the bow. All this very powerful bow, a Vishnu's bow, very. And he thinks that if I can bring Krishna to, because all his plans to kill Krishna has failed, he sends all these demons. And Krishna just, you know, it's like, just like nothing. <laughs> it's like a, like a 
little breeze comes and he just pushes it away. <laughs> the Krishna killing demons in Vrindavan was just play. You know, it's really not, it's not fair, really. Krishna's not fair. I mean, sometimes they say, you know, why should Krishna fight with people in the material world? And there's, there's no competition. <laughs> He's cheating. He wins all the time. <laughs> But sometimes he he uh, makes it a little excited, just to make it, you know, to make people get a little more suspenseful. They get worried that Krishna's going to lose. So he puts a little dramatic show into it to, to give it a little, some, you know, some fanfare. But that's Krishna. I think we can shut the lights out. Yeah, there. We don't. I think we got the beautiful sun coming from the. the the beautiful Michigan River coming off the river. And uh, so, you know, so there is criticism. It's in the, I, I came across one, why should Krishna fight with anybody in the material world? It's not fair. He's just like, he wins. <laughs> There's no fight. <laughs> But it's his program for giving liberation to those who are inimical or atheistic, demoniac, and at the same time also giving pleasure to his devotees and reducing the burden of the world. That's why he comes. He has to do this work sometimes when no one else can do it, so he does it. And that's, you know, and he, but it's, for him it's a play. It's not really... So now comes his thinking... I failed with all these other demons. All these other demons that were killed by Krishna, they were all conquered by Kamsa. And they became servants of Kamsa because it describes in the Garga Samhita that um, Kamsa was challenging and defeating one demon after another. And as soon as he would do that, he would make that demon his servant. And that demon would have to carry out the will of Kamsa. Kamsa was powerful. You know, Bakasur and as what was it? Keshi and Sakatasura and Trinavarta and Aristasur and Vyomasur and all of the demons, Palambasur, Agasur, they were all defeated by by Kamsa previously. So now they're all coming on his behalf. You know, they're just doing it because, you know, if they don't, Kamsa will kill them. <laughs> so, <laughs> he's a rascal. <laughs> Big rascal. So they're coming, and Krishna's dispatching them one after another to the boat of Yamaraj. And now Kamsa thinks, if I can bring him to Mathura, then he's on my territory, I got the plans. <laughs> and so he sends a Akura the crew is, you know, he's kind of happy to go, but he knows Kamsa is a demon and a rascal. But somehow he did a little service for Kamsa, and he's kind of like in disguise as a as a friend of Kamsa, but he's really not. He's just doing this. He's actually a relative of Krishna. He's his uncle. I think he's one of the brothers of uh, Vasudev. And. Uh, so now he's excited to go to Vrindavan, and we hear a little bit in these translations how uh, he's anticipating what will happen when he gets to Vrindavan and Krishna will see him and Krishna will do this and I will do that. And, and so it all came true. You know, he's remembering how Krishna fulfilled all his desires when he was thinking, boy, when I, I just can't wait to meet Krishna. And it was so beautiful. Everything that he was dreaming of was better than he even dreamed of. Was, Krishna treated him so wonderfully and worshipped him and honored him. Because Krishna respects Vedic culture and Akrura is a senior in age. And he's also the, his uncle, his uncle Akrura. So Krishna gave him all regards, Balaram also, both. Now they're on their way back to... Uh, but Kuro made a big mistake. We'll find out later. He has to pay for it. When he took Krishna out of Vrindavan, he didn't say anything to the gopis. 
and the gopis were well, they were angry at Kura for for taking Krishna, but at the same time he didn't pay them any attention either. He didn't say, "My dear gopis, you know, I just have to take Krishna for a little while, but I'll well, Krishna will be back. Don't worry, you know, I understand how much you love Krishna. Just be patient." He didn't do any of that. He just got his chariot, put Krishna on, and they, so they cursed him. <laughs> he wasn't at all polite. <laughs> later on, you'll see, in the later chapters, in the 53rd, 54th chapter, he gets into trouble, gets into bad association, and, and he starts doing things. And that was all because of the curse of the, 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 go, the gopis. Just because he wasn't, you know, taking proper etiquette to say, well, you know, I have to take Krishna out, so just, you know, I'm sorry, you know, I know how you feel. Some nice words of solace, but nothing. He didn't do any of that. That was his mistake. And so, now, you'll see he's, he's uh, and Krishna asks him, you know, how is, how is the, the residents of Mathura doing, our family members? And Krishna knows, and he also says that, obviously, with King Kamsa there, they can't be doing good. <laughs> they're, they're suffering, they have difficulties. And Krishna knows, but he's inquiring anyway, just to hear from Akura. And so this starts to play itself out in a very nice, wonderful way. Akura's vision comes really, really amazing. He gets, Krishna gives him so much mercy. So we're preparing for the upcoming events when Krishna enters into, into uh, Mathura. And Krishna, when you get that chapter, is really exciting. When Krishna enters in Mathura, he's like, okay, I'm ready. <laughs> he's walking in like he's God. <laughs> he is. <laughs> but he's, he's, he's strutting along and the women are glorifying him. People are coming up and... And somebody, that, I won't get into that chapter now because it's coming up, and so we'll save that when it comes. Up. But here we can we can see a little bit about um, Akura's love for for Krishna and Krishna's love. Krishna did, did so many things just to make him feel happy, and this is the proper etiquette. When and when a guest comes. <clears throat> just like a guest comes to our temple. We should respect that guest as, as if that guest was the Supreme Personality of Godhead. That is the etiquette. Anyone who comes into the temple, for whatever reason, they're being, Krishna somehow or other sent them. And so it's our duty to make sure that they feel happy, comfortable, and get a little an understanding of what Krishna consciousness is about, and especially, Prashad. <laughs> every Prabhupada said, every guest has to go get pr Prashad. He said, we always have to have Prashadam ready. Prabhupada, <clears throat> I didn't hear Prabhupada speak this, but the devotees were speaking it, that Prabhupada had said that all our temples should uh, prepare nice Prashadam all day, Puris, Halava, Sabji, Chutney, and uh, keep it, he said, four preps, and keep it all day, and then when guests come in, they get a full plate of prasadam. And he said, at the end of the day, and if there's anything left over, the devotees can eat it. <laughs> and Prabhupada, this, Prabhupada understood how important it is to honor guests. Of course, around in Chicago, sometimes the guests are a little bit, uh, you know, they're from the streets, but still, <laughs> We still see them as spirit souls. We give them some prashadam. We honor that. Jitendri is good at that, right? He takes care of all these people who come around and gives them prashadam. And that's proper. That's, that's, that's the best way to uh, give them a start in Krishna consciousness, just to give them prashadam. But you never know. Sometimes Krishna sends a very important guest and if we treat that person right, then you can see that person may also open up and do so many wonderful things for the devotees. 
So that's a very important part of our culture is to honor guests. It's, it's one of the highest principles of Vaishnava uh, culture. Uh, we don't consider this our temple. We consider it it's Krishna's temple. And we take care of the temple. We take care of the responsibilities of taking all the services. And whoever comes, it's their temple just as much as it is our temple, except we've been given the good fortune to take care of the temple. And that's our, that's our good fortune. And when we see things like that, and, you know, when people get a nice exam, a nice experience when they come, then they want to come back. <laughs> they want to come back. All the devotees were very friendly. I got some nice prashadam. Uh, I even got some understanding of what they're about. These are for new people, but even people who have been coming regularly, everyone should be respected and honored as somebody that is important. And that's the mood of temple, temple etiquette, to see everyone as special when they come to take darshan of the Supreme Lord. Because Krishna in the heart tells them, go to the temple. <laughs> And then they go. <laughs> they don't know it, but they, you know, they're getting the mercy of the Lord in that way. So honoring, you will see how Krishna here, he, how he honored. He said, he said, the Lord said, my dear, gentle uncle Akur, was your trip here comfortable? May all good fortune be yours. Are our well-wishing friends and relatives both distant and close happy? and in good health. And he goes on to say, you know, he understands, he goes on to say, but my dear Akra, as long as Kamsa, the disease of our family, which we call our uncle, is still there, it's not bothered to ask the well-being of others because we know that they are not doing good under his care. But Krishna is very, he is the personification. When during and during the Rajan, preparing for the Raja Sukha sacrifice, when King Yudhisthira was uh, was uh, organizing a big, big affair to honor all of the guests in in Hastinapur, uh, different kinds of people were coming: royal people, sages, saints, ordinary people. People were coming, and everyone in the palace was given a particular service. And Krishna, one of Krishna's service was to greet the guests. <laughs> and you'll read, it's in the first canto, Krishna responds to eight different people, categories of people, in eight different ways. And to the sages, he bows down. To the equals, he smiles very friendly. To others, he shakes their hands. To the little kids, he shows a little. He shows some affection to them. And depending on the, the the person, Krishna responds to each one in a different way, but all in the same way, in the sense of walking in them, greeting them, and making them, um, you know, feel happy. And so that, Krishna took that service. <laughs> now you see how the supreme personality of God that He teaches. And he also honors the etiquette of uh, Vaishnavas. And if we learn how to do that more and more, you'll see our temples will be much more full of devotees and at the same time more prosperous. Because you never know who comes through the door. Sometimes <laughs> some special soul that we don't even know of. <laughs> Okay, so these are a few things in, in this. And uh, that whole culture of Vaisnava etiquette is the ornament of a devotee. How a devotee behaves in each and every situation is really the basis of the, of the devotee's relationship with Krishna. <clears throat> when we have a nice, when we develop a relationship with Krishna, then how we treat others is more or less a reflection of that same relationship. Sometimes you see it in the reverse way. How we treat others is also how we treat Krishna. <laughs> you can look at it from both angles. But both of them have their connection with the mood of devotion. 
like that. Of course, sometimes people don't understand, and sometimes we, um, sometimes they misunderstand. One of the greatest uh, sources of problems is misunderstanding. The husband and wife sometimes don't misunderstand each other. They misunderstand each other. There's a story where one husband and one wife, they were fighting, 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 and then they got tired of fighting. They thought, we're going to end it. And so they decided, well, before we end it, let's give it another try. So they went to some marriage counselor. And the marriage counselor was quite good. So he was trying to find out what is the source of this contention. So he finally got to the husband and said, and the husband says, she doesn't love me. And to prove it, she bakes bread. And when she cuts the bread, she gives me the end piece every time. This proves she doesn't love me. True story. And now, the wife was Italian. And if you know Italians, they think the end piece of the bread is the best part. So she was giving him what she felt was the best part, and he thought she was doing that just to make him feel less. Misunderstanding. <laughs> and the virus was saved, <laughs> just in case you want to know the end. <laughs> but that's an example of how people misunderstand each other, and based on assumptions, and the problem, there's one story where uh, Prabhupada, sometimes he would greet guests, so there was a very special guest that had come. Prabhupada happened to be in the temple room. And so Prabhupada turned to the devotee who was with him and he said, go get some maha, referring to the guest. So the boy goes and he goes into the pajari room and the pajari just said, well, I just put the offering on the altar and you're going to have to wait till the offering is over and then you'll have the maha. So the boy returned to Prabhupada and said, well, it's being offered and so we have to wait. Prabhupada said, no, get it now. He didn't want the, he didn't want the guest to wait. <laughs> so the boy goes back into the Pajari room and this time the Pajari is doing his Gayatri. <laughs> so he walks right past the Pajari he walks on the altar, takes the plate off, and starts walking off. <laughs> now you can imagine what that Pajari was thinking. <laughs> so he starts chasing after the devotee, <laughs> and they both arrived at Prabhupada at the same time. <laughs> so who's wrong? Was the Pajari wrong? Was the boy wrong? Was Prabhupada wrong? Misunderstanding. <laughs> You see how, how situations come because people misunderstand each other. So that happens a lot. So in relationships, it's always, always good to make sure everything is clear and understood. And that way there's no misunderstanding. Especially husband and wife when you're very close. Sometimes you assume things that everything is, there's some assumption based on the relationship. And the husband is supposed to know that the wife, the husband thinks that the wife knows, and the wife thinks that the husband knows, but it doesn't happen. <laughs> and that something else comes up. So, um, in order to avoid that, the communication is the basis of, of all related, honest and open communications. So we can see how misunderstandings are always uh, the cause, many times, not always, but many times, the source of contention between different individuals. As soon as it, it's clear, then the contention is gone. Because, you know, no, nobody has the same vision. Each person is an individual. and every, Everyone sees the same situation slightly different, 
Sometimes people see it almost the same, but always because of our consciousness, no two consciousnesses are exactly alike. Only when you become fully Krishna conscious, then everything is clear. But until then, we have what is called subjective consciousness, which is a mixture of something material and something spiritual, or the perception that we carry with us based on our experiences in the world. And this formulates our character, our qualities, our relationships. So no two people see the same external situation exactly the same time. And that's why communication is important in order to come to some kind of conclusion about, especially when there's some responsibility for activity, and, and then it clears everything up, helps to clear things up. So that's important because the, obje the, the environment is really subjective. There is an objective reality, but that is that is pure Krishna consciousness. And Krishna tells it in the Bhagavad Gita. He says, thus when you learn the truth, you know that all living beings are my parts and parcel. They're in me and they're mine. In other words, one realizes that every living entity, no matter what body they may have, Vidya Vinaya Sampane, Brahmani Gavi Hastini, and Suni Chaiva Supakecha Pandita Samadarsha. Samadarsha means one who sees the equal vision, each and every living being, as being part and parcel of Krishna. Krishna is situated in the heart. Of course, the etiquette is to learn how to interact with people or not interact with people based on the proper understanding. But ultimately, the vision of a, a pure soul and the pure vision can also be applied even to those who are not pure in consciousness. We can apply that pure vision. And that is the process of, you know, theoretically practicing the reality until the reality becomes the no longer theory anymore, it becomes actual realization. And that's our process in Krishna consciousness. And so everyone who comes through this, you know, door should be seen as, you know, here's a soul looking for Krishna, here's a soul interested in, in something about spiritual life, let, let's, so let's, let's help them in some way to uh, gain something by their visit. No one should go away feeling neglected. Okay, so that's a little bit about Vaishnav etiquette. You see how, how Krishna is the, he's the, he's the epitome of Vaishnav etiquette. He carries it with him in the, in the ultimate, ultimate sense of it. He treats everyone accordingly. Of course, he's God. <laughs> but he doesn't think I'm God and therefore, you know, I got like, I can treat you any way I want because I'm God. No. <laughs> he's not like that. <laughs> he's very kind. <laughs> he's super kind. <laughs> you know, you know, tough guys on the block, you know, they think, well, you know, I'm better than everybody, so who cares about you? <laughs> well, the devotee might think, well, there, here's the karmi, and I'm a devotee. And they might get that subtle, may, may not be so prominent, but subtle idea that we're like we're a little bit, we are, in one sense, we are more fortunate. But the idea is to make the unfortunate fortunate by giving them opportunities to move forward in spiritual life. Okay, so I'm not sure. That's a short class, 33 minutes. <laughs> Any questions? Comments, Subha? Yeah. Do we have an audience out there too? Yeah. Yeah, we do. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Such a 
wonderful points that um, you brought on in the class, specifically uh, the point of communication and, um, and also connected to what you mentioned of a cruel mistake in not properly communicating to the, to the gopis that ended causing him some serious struggle. Um, yeah, he got involved with the situation with the Chamantaka jewel yeah. and the plot to kill Satrajit. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so um, one thing that you mentioned was this subjective um, sort of type of consciousness that one might have when there is the combination of spirit, spiritual and material, which in a sense sort of uh, fits the definition of a kanishta or a neophyte devotee, mixed. No, it can be mixed even for madhyama also. Ah. Yeah, until one reaches pure Krishna consciousness, then there is always, the, not necessarily, but the ten, there is a tendency that one can act in a material way mm. or think in a material way. Mm. or even desire in a material way. Mm. I was thinking that in the case of when you're in that situation that you have that subjective perspective of things and it's a reality and then you have, as you mentioned, different people have different subjective perceptions and, and understandings and even when there is clear communication with, you know, even when that is, that communication could be something that is not understood yeah. or not even accepted by other parties. So the conflict is very easy to happen in, mm -hmm. in this type of subjective, uh, uh, you know, exchanges and things like that. So what's, what would you say is, guidelines and things that, you know, we have as people that are... But being very perceptive on how people are accepting what you're saying. And you just see well, whether they're accepting or not accepting, understanding or not understanding. <laughs> Don't assume that what you're saying is the absolute truth and then I mean, if they don't get it, that's their problem. <laughs> That may be the case, but the thing is, we can always approach the same subject matter from different angles of vision. Like sometimes Prabhupada would, people would ask Prabhupada a question, and he would say, if you just chant Hare Krishna, you'll understand everything, <laughs> without even answering the question. <laughs> That's one way to answer a question. And Prabhupada said, again, if someone asked him a question, he would say, just go back home, back to Godhead, and you'll know everything. <laughs> And then sometimes he would explain the answer in different ways. So, seeing your audience or see, are getting a little bit understanding of who you're communicating with or what type of mentality you're communicating with and then try to make that communication as, you know, as effective as possible. I think the you know, it's, we should be seeing how everything we're saying or doing is being received or not received. <laughs> and if we see something that's not being received at what we're doing, we might think, well, maybe I shouldn't have done that or shouldn't have said that. That's just one possible way to evaluate how things are going. There's many ways. <laughs> Like yesterday, uh, we were getting, we were traveling from Zagreb to Istanbul, changing planes there. And so, uh, and then we had to get another plane from Istanbul to here. So when we were in getting into the, you know, getting into the aircraft in Istanbul, I was standing in a line. 
And people were running this way and that way, everybody was getting out of line. <laughs> and there was one guy next to me who was, you know, he was, me and him were kind of being just pushed aside. <laughs> so I said to the guy, you know, I said, organized confusion. <laughs> And he liked that for some reason. <laughs> so then he talked and turned to me and he said, oh, okay. He said, well, well, well what did he say to me? He said, uh, oh, what do you, uh, uh, you live in Chicago? Because we were headed for Chicago. I said, no. I said, he said, where are you from? I said, New Jersey. And then he said, uh, okay. He said, he said, I said, I travel around a lot. He said, that must be fun. <laughs> and I said, uh, well, I talk about God. <laughs> and that was the last thing I said. <laughs> so then, I, when I came to pick up my luggage in Chicago, he's there by the, the you know, by the conveyor belt. So I came up and I, I said, I made it. <laughs> and he smiled. And then uh, we got talking a little bit. And I said, where are you from? He said, Detroit. I said, oh, I've been there. I said, we got a temple in Chicago. So I said, can I give you some of our information? He said, yeah. He was like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I gave him a card. I gave him a little pamphlet. He's looking through the pamphlet and he says, Are you in any of the pictures? <laughs> I said, No. <laughs> and then I said, You know, I said, Well, you know, I can stop in any of our temples and have a re vegetarian meal. So I, you know, the whole conversation started off because we both were like in this confused line, getting in line in Istanbul. It was just like so crazy. So I just picked up on that as a way to start some conversation. Because if I would have said anything else, it, would have wouldn't, it wouldn't have worked. So he, we were both experiencing the confusion, so we had something to connect with. <laughs> so it worked out, and, he, you know, and then I shook my hand and we parted, <laughs> took off. <laughs> it was nice. So, I, I, that was Krishna's mercy. You know, I mean, Krishna, you know, Krishna arranges from you know devotees to meet people and talk to them. But it didn't start off with anything spiritual <laughs> at all. It just came to that a little later. And then when I was going through immigration, the man said, uh, "What was the purpose of your trip?" Because, you know, you have to write down where you've been. And I was thinking, my trip to Chicago? I, he said, no, no, your trip. Boy. I said, I, well, we go around, we talk about God, and we just try to help people understand more about God. He said, oh. That's all he said. <laughs> he was like surprised, I guess. Because <laughs> I was wearing army clothes, and I wasn't wearing... Uh, but you know, you got the bald head and the Sika, you got a bead bag hanging from your shirt. <laughs> so you look like half spiritual, half material. <laughs> so, so yeah, there's so many, there's so many opportunities to reach people, and especially now, it's like, people are really, really, really kind of confused. They're confused and they're fearful. And it's, it's really, especially in the United States, it's a good chance to really spread Krishna consciousness now. I think it's easier to talk to people now, in a, at least in a, in a way that they might be more receptive to what we have. Yes, uh, Karuna Nidhi, Karuna Nidhi, he preaches to the, his 
passengers in his cab. You're still driving a cab? No, I'm not. You, you, you just gave that up, huh? Last, uh, from a couple years, I'm not. Okay. You got a corona. <laughs> yes, Maharaj, we are very happy to receive you. And uh, one question came in the second verse. Uh, that means how, whatever Akrura was contemplating on the way, that wish became fulfilled yeah. by, you know, by arriving there. And uh, same thing happened several times with me also. Now, today morning, I was, when I was writing Bhag, uh, Bhagavatam Sloka, I was thinking Maharaj should sing that is Asumati Nandan. <laughs> and you also sing that. I was so that. Oh. I was confused and how, how that uh, You were the cause of it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, how, my question is, what is, how, who is uh, coordinating between our thought with Krishna's thought or with your thought? And sometimes you are having dream or something. Krishna is in the heart. Krishna is in the heart. The very living entity he knows everything. If you want to make, he wants to make something happen. But if you have a particular desire, and the desire is, is a desire that is acceptable, then you, your desire has an effect on the environment. Even if you don't speak it or act on it. You can understand what's about to happen at every moment if you can perceive the environment the way it's being, because everything is happening according to the conditioned souls or desires. So the desires pushes the energy in a certain direction, and that desire, the stronger that desire, the more likely something will come immediately. And sometimes something comes later. But it then, it depends on the, if the desire is mixed, then maybe nothing. But if the desire is pure, Mm. And, and that even, as, even the materialists know that by desiring in a certain way, you move the, ma the material energy in in that or same direction. <laughs> yeah, the demons are successful because they have strong desires to cause po problems to everyone, and they're very effective. <laughs> Because their desires are really strong. <laughs> yeah, the desire of anger is very is one of the strongest desires. <laughs> and demons are always angry. <laughs> but if you're protected by Krishna, you're not affected. <laughs> no matter how strong a person's desire is. If you if you take shelter of Krishna like that, so everything's based on desire. But when you depend on Krishna, then you're successful. But you're depending on Krishna has to be in line with Krishna's desire, not just you can't have a material desire and then depend on Krishna. <laughs> You can, and it may not work, and it may work. It depends. That that's hard to say whether Krishna may fulfill it or he may not. <laughs> that's up to Krishna. He knows whether by fulfilling it, will will it help your Krishna consciousness or will it take away from your Krishna consciousness? If it's going to help your Krishna consciousness, many sometimes Krishna fulfills the material desire. Sometimes devotees will, they want, well, they want to get some position in Krishna consciousness. So that's material to, to try to get a position. But sometimes Krishna will give it because he says, oh, that devotee can use it for doing greater service like that. <laughs> so Krishna, he sees what is beneficial for the devotee. Jai Baladev. Hare Krishna.
Hare Krishna Maharaj, thank you for your class. Um, um, you made a lot of um, very important points for me, and I'm sure for a lot of devotees, um, especially uh, regarding honoring devotees. And um, first of all, I'd like to appreciate you because whenever I was depressed, and I came to the temple, and you always made devotees dance, and um, that depression would immediately go away. So um, that's one thing I always appreciate about you, many things, and especially emphasizing if our Christian consciousness is getting off, it's probably because you're not doing japa properly. And then without fail, it's for me too. So I always appreciate that point every time you will come um, and emphasize that point. As far as honor and devotion, I was, there's a few devotees I would like to honor because you make the point that uh, when you receive a guest, you should honor them like the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Yes, it's true. We respect them in the proper way, yeah. yeah. In other words, sometimes that's where it's seen. It, it explains that, that when a guest comes to your home mm -hmm. or to, you know, your temple, they're seen in that same way. In other words, as you would treat the Lord, you would treat the guest. Mm -hmm. In other words, in the best possible way trying to, you know, mm -hmm. see what you can do to make them their visit, you know, a nice experience. Mm. So, um, I appreciate a few devotees who I feel like I'm undeserving of their care when I go to their home, like Mother Rohini, Subhakar Prabhu, but especially I would like to um, highlight Kareem and Nidhi Prabhu because during this whole pandemic, most of the temples were closed, understandable to most devotees, including myself. But Karim Nidhi, he decided to start an online Zoom program to speak Krishna Kata to some parents and their, um, st and their children. And for nine months, I've been going for five months, but um, gradually Krishna has blessed him that he reposted the reruns on Facebook. And he has 4,000 subscribers now, and people all over the world are reciprocating with Kareem and Nidhi, and when I go to his home, he, um, you know, he, you know, without fail, you know, treats me and anyone who comes to his home, you know, like, like the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and I'm very grateful for that. And so my question is regarding um, how we could be, um, the difference between um, thoughtful and thoughtless. We've seen a lot of the time that a thoughtless leader says, I have to make the right decision. A thoughtless leader says, whatever decision I make is right. And so you all, without fail, when you would come to Chicago Temple, you would always tell the story of a devotee, a guest who would come to the temple, and the devotee says, would you like to become like us? And he says, of course not, because if you treat me like you treat each other, <laughs> then, um, um, then uh, I wouldn't want to become a, you treat your guests better. So how do we know from our own perspective, how do we know just everyone, it doesn't matter what position you are, position or position, how can we determine whether we're being thoughtful or thoughtless in our relationships? Because generally we self-righteous, I speak for myself, so how do we determine whether we're being thoughtful or thoughtless? <laughs> be thoughtful. <laughs> Don't be thoughtless. Thoughtless means that you're not seeing the whole thing. You're just acting <clears throat> my way or the highway. <laughs> or another saying, everyone is entitled to my opinion. <laughs> so, you know, you know, we have to repeat what Prabhupada says, but in our own understanding, that's Krishna consciousness. We can repeat Prabhupada, and we should, but at the same time we also have to realize what Prabhupada is saying, so when we have, to, we have a similar situation, we can explain it or repeat it in our own words. And that's that's taking the knowledge and applying it and getting the understanding from that application. Well, that's Krishna consciousness. So being thoughtless means we're just not really serious about what we're doing. We're just whimsical or arrogant, either one. Two opposite sides, the arrogance and the whimsical. Mm -hmm.
Krishna Maharaj. It's nice to see you after a long time. Hare Krishna. I consider very fortunate. Uh, thank you for your wonderful class. Uh, my question is like on this particularly Akura was meditating on the Lord and finally Lord reciprocated according to his desire. So we in our Krishna conscious like myself I'm saying uh, go through many things up and down in our spiritual life but we do some service menial service whatever according to our capacity so how we understand these things that uh, am I going to write this or am I doing wrong uh, what's the like whatever service we do is it in a is pleasing to Krishna uh, or how can I progress on this path of Krishna point? Well, pleasing to Krishna means trying to please Krishna. <laughs> That's a conscious act. It's not just, well, I'll just do something and hope it pleases Krishna. <laughs> no, we should try to please Krishna. That's a mood of bhakti. Ayabila sita sunam jnana kamana anukulena krishna silanam bhakti uttamam to please Krishna with a desire to please Krishna. Demons please Krishna too, but they don't have any desire to please Krishna. So we should try to think how when I'm doing something, what would be pleasing to the Lord. So if you know, the more you get to know about Krishna, I mean, you know what he likes. He likes specific things, but then again, ultimately the, the, the point is, bhakti is what pleases Krishna. So trying to please Krishna is bhakti. <laughs> Even if you fall short of the quality, still, if you're making some attempt to please Krishna, Krishna will like see that as your, he'll accept that, oh, they're trying to please me. Maybe the, the activity wasn't so perfect, but at least they're trying to please me. So that's, that's the mood. And knowing Krishna, just like, for instance, I'll give you an example. Um, one, of, one way to please Lord Chaitanya is to sing, is to sing, Hare Haraya Namah Krishna Yadavaya Namaha Yadavaya Madhavaya Keshavaya. Lord Chaitanya likes that. So when you add that to the kirtan, then you can know that you're, you're making, and you're doing that as a way to please Lord Chaitanya. He likes that particular. Um, Bhajan, which is also the holy names. That's the holy names of the Lord anyway. So that's mentioned in Chaitanya Charitamrita that the Lord likes that particular Bhajan. And he illustrated when he was here. So you get a little understanding of what Krishna likes. <laughs> or, you know, when you're cooking, you think, well, what is he like? what time of the day it is. So then you cook according to the time of the day and find out what he eats during that time of the day. And you can make preparations like that. There's different ways like that. The activity and the mood, both. Try to please Krishna. If one is practicing humility, that's very pleasing, pleasing to Krishna. One is practicing tolerance, that's very pleasing to Krishna. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Expert at doing something is not so much a glorifiable quality, although it's an attractive quality. It's not as glorifiable. I'll give you an example. It was, um, <clears throat> the devotees were in Vrindavan and they had met this uh, very expert bhajan singer. And he was really, you know, really good. He was also had a, he was a little bit famous for his singing bhajan. So they brought him to the temple during the morning program and he came. And they asked Kadim Prabhupada if he could sing. Prabhupada said, yeah, give him a chance to sing. So he started to sing, but although he was singing very beautifully, 
Prabhupada could understand he was proud. <laughs> he was proud of his voice, proud of his abilities. But Prabhupada stopped it. <laughs> the Prabhupada could sense he's he's more like you know, he's he's more like a showman than a you know, a devotee. The Prabhupada stopped it and then told one other devotee to sing. And this devotee couldn't sing at all. <laughs> Prabhupada picked someone who was just more like a frog. <laughs> and he was singing, Prabhupada said, very nice. <laughs> Prabhupada was enjoying it. <laughs> His boy had bhakti, but he didn't have any musical <laughs> you know, abilities. <laughs> So that's an example, <laughs> you know, where this other person, there was no bhakti there, it was all about him, but he was expert, so. So when you have both, then, then that's, the, that's the ideal. When you have expertise and you have bhakti along with it, then that's preaching. <laughs> that's preaching. But bhakti is always... Krishna, he's bhakti amam, abhijananti, by bhakti he's known. <laughs> or he's attracted by bhakti. <laughs> so offering prayers to the Lord, appreciating the Lord, that's a, that's a form of bhakti. Hey, is there anything else? Any other questions? Okay, so I can't see the time. 8.40. Okay, that's good. I have another class at 10 o'clock online, so I have to maybe end here. Okay, thank you very much. Srimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.